Baptist Church, um, a building which happens to be on the National Registry. And we are hoping certainly um, within a couple of months that we will turn in our application for the Stonehouse Tavern. And that this time next year will be on the National Registry. As a director of CHS, I'd like to give you a couple of updates on things. One is that tomorrow, um, People's Bank is going to be having a car wash, which will benefit three of the um, nonprofits here in town, and CHS is one of them. So if your car looks like it could use a wash, please take your car down. Secondly, we've turned in two grants recently, or turned in applications for two grants. One of them being a very large grant um, to LCHIP. And um, should we receive this grant, which we won't know about until early December, it will mean that we will be able to secure the stone house in terms of the, the elements. Um, we'll be able to take care of the chimneys, the roof, the doors for restoration, the windows for restoration, etc. That is going to require a bit of excess money because of the fact that if you know about LCHIP, you will know that it is matching funds. So at our meeting today, we discussed how to reach out to the people to earn those matching funds. So you'll be hearing from us. Other programs. Well, we only have one more for this summer, and on August 1st, we have Lynn Borofsky coming to speak right here. Um, that is a Thursday, and she's going to speak to us about one of our eccentric residents, Madame Cherie. You may know that recently Ann Stokes passed away. And Ann Stokes had um, a great deal of material that actually belonged to Madame Cherie because she bought her property. And uh, that some of that will be shared with you through Lynn. Um, some will be coming to CHS, to Brattleboro, and also personally to Lynn as a result of Ann Stokes' estate. Important facts. Number one, the bathroom. Should you need a bathroom, you must go down the stairs, go all the way to the back of the building, and then go as far to the left as you can and you will find a bathroom, a single bathroom. Um, we know it's a very warm night, uh, so if you need something to drink, some water, please, we do have some in the back and also uh, a couple of cookies and brownies and those sort of types of things. But we do ask that you eat them out in the hallway and not here in the sanctuary. And last but not least, um, we do have items for sale. And I noticed that one of our Spofford Lake books has already been bought. Um, if you don't have it and you're from around here, I know that I refer to it on a regular basis. And hopefully, when once our project with the Stonehouse Tavern is well underway, we will be updating with a new edition. Tonight's program. The fact is, tonight's program speaker needs no introduction if you are a history buff in the Monadnock area. <laughs> it is Alan Romro. He is the director of the Historical Society of Cheshire County. And while he could speak to you on most any topic, Tonight he will be telling us about taverns and other lodgings of the Nanak area from the middle 1700s to the middle 1900s. Now, of which Chesterfield, of course, and Spofford Lake have several.
probably within a couple of weeks or so, Reggie um, got in touch with me and said so. Where? You're From the Historical Society. On the website? Yes, we'll put it on the website. Thank you. Thank you. I like the podium here. Book, <laughs> books to stand on if you need them, that's good. The presentation tonight is entitled The Friendly Tavern, and as was mentioned, it really deals with public lodging in the region from the 1700s up into the 1900s. So we look at taverns, hotels, grand hotels, resorts, such as those that were on Spofford Lake. And then we get into roadside cottages and motels and country inns even to show how public lodging has changed and uh, why it changed over the years as well. And lots of interesting stories based on about 36 different taverns and hotels and inns in this region. And it was interesting and a little worrying to me when I noticed when I received the notification for this program that said this is a new program. I was hoping they meant it was new on their schedule because it's not a newly developed program. This is something that we put together at the Historical Society more than 30 years ago. So you'll notice, actually you'll notice that I have antique equipment to run this program. That, that's a slide projector for any of you who aren't old enough to remember what that is. And I'm hoping it lasts through tonight's program so we can see it all. But I have wanted to give you an introduction, first of all, on really the history of taverns and their purpose in the region before we get into the, the slide program. And I wanted to start with a quote from Donna Bell and Jim Garvin, which they opened their landmark book on the road north of Boston, New Hampshire taverns and turnpikes, 1700 to 1900 with. It's really a concise description, but very far-reaching description of the importance of the tavern in the early history of New Hampshire. They wrote, it provided a meeting place for, local, for the local electorate and for social organizations. On occasion, it substituted for the meeting house, the school, the courtroom, the store, and the hospital. Its yard doubled as military training fields, sports arena, stockyards, and fairgrounds. And by its very nature, the tavern was also a place of comfort relaxation and gossip, a home away from home, a place where people congregated at times of celebration or play. The tavern offered fellowship enhanced by the bottle, the pipe, the shared and dog-eared newspaper, and the diverting spectacle of the passing world. The tavern was truly a public house, its doors open to all. And indeed, that's just the way it was here in Cheshire County. Our tavern served all of those purposes, from public meeting place and social gathering spot to newsroom, and especially a welcome place of rest, relaxation, and revival for people who were traveling on the roads of the Monadnock region. They were truly public health houses. Taverns were affected by the early colonial laws of New Hampshire. They were regulated by law. Town selectmen licensed taverns to control the sale of liquor and the number of taverns in each town as well. Tavern keepers were required to provide food and lodging for travelers and their horses. So by law, they had to have food and lodging available for people who were traveling if they wanted to run a tavern and for their horses as well. New Hampshire passed several laws at the colony and then eventually the state level to control gaming, profanity, and excess drinking at taverns. In the 1770s, it was illegal to drink at a tavern after 10 p.m. and to drink at a tavern for more than two hours or to drink to, quote, drunkenness, according to the law of New Hampshire. Laws were enacted to limit the number of taverns in each town, and this is from the wording of the law, quote, to prevent nurseries of vice and debauchery. In the 1700s, implements for gaming weren't allowed in public houses. So that included shuffleboards, billiards, nine pins, and selling liquor without a license resulted in a heavy fine. So these early taverns really were simply public houses. They looked like any other houses in the neighborhood, but were simply open to the public. But they did require several things to meet those legal regulations. They had to be able to mix and sell liquor, prepare and sell food. They had to have beds for the travelers and entertainment, so to speak, for the animals. So housing and food for the animals. So the tavern needed a bar, a kitchen, and a dining space sufficient to make and serve meals, public bedrooms, and a barn or a carriage shed to shelter and feed the animals. Most taverns had a hall or large meeting room, often upstairs, 
to hold public meetings and dances as well. Finally, the taverns needed signs so people traveling would know that this was a tavern. So at all of the taverns, there was a roadside sign hanging out with different elements on them like eagles and various animals to attract the attention of the traveler. <clears throat> New Hampshire taverns generally offered a warm greeting, ample food and clean rooms. Despite these positive attributes, the tavern experience was much, much different than we expect in a hotel today. Early taverns usually had a common sleeping room, so people traveling would all go upstairs and they would sleep in the same room. And sometimes the beds themselves would be shared with other travelers. Some taverns posted rules and regulations that said no more than five people could sleep in a single bed. So that's the way it was then. A bath or a fire in the sleeping room would require an extra fee. And if the common sleeping room filled up, they would lay out mattresses and bedspreads, so in, maybe in the ballroom or even down in the tap room so people could have a place to sleep. As I mentioned, taverns were required to sell food for the traveler, tra travelers, but that doesn't mean there was much variety. Often the meals were pretty much the same from morning to afternoon to evening and from tavern to tavern. There wasn't much of variety. Room service was very rare and expensive if you could even get it. Three meals were usually served at the tavern, breakfast, dinner, and supper, and sometimes they would add tea in the afternoon as well. Breakfast was a large meal and usually consisted of the same menu as supper later in the day, including meat, eggs, bacon, fish, cheese, bread, and potatoes. The midday meal would be pretty much the same except they would have some sorts of vegetables, a salad, and fresh fruit in season. And they also supplied food for the road as well, so the tavern keeper would be able to prepare food and sell it to you for the road. The primitive roads of the 18th century and the development of improved highways in the 19th century played a major role in the history of New Hampshire taverns. During the 1730s, 40s, and 50s, most of the roads around here were simply blazed trails into the wilderness in southwestern New Hampshire. From the 1750s to the 1800s, trees were removed and roads were widened and improved. And the early 1800s saw the introduction of turnpike companies that built much better roads. They would pay to build turnpikes, improved highways, and they were often graded and incorporated bridges and stone culverts, which you hadn't had before, and you would pay a fee to use one of the turnpikes. Enoch Hale of Ringe built the first bridge across the Connecticut River in 1785, and that actually connected North Walpole with Bellows Falls, the first bridge across the river. There were also ferries that operated to allow travelers to cross the river between Vermont and New Hampshire. New Hampshire. And then in the 1800s, covered bridges and stone arch bridges started to be used and making travel much, much easier. But the primitive nature of the highways and the means of transport, people were on horseback, in sleighs, carriages, or even walking, meant that large numbers of taverns were necessary so that people could stop often to warm themselves by the fireplace and to get a meal. Stagecoaches began to offer transportation in the 1760s, but that was over toward the coast of New Hampshire. It was another 40 years or so before stage service arrived here in southwest New Hampshire, again due to the quality of the roads. Stage lines made a point of stopping at taverns where food was good and always available to travelers, so there was a relationship between the stage company and the tavern keeper. Commercial interest other than stage lines also made use of the taverns. The mail and the newspapers came and were dropped off at the tavern by stage or post riders and were often distributed right from there. Uh, in Keene, the Richardson Tavern on West Street was the very first post office in Keene, for example. Teamsters with cattle, sheep, and turkeys also made use of the taverns on their drives. So they would not only offer meal and bed for the Teamsters, but feed and enclosure for the livestock as well. <clears throat> Wagon trains of produce began to travel through the region on their way to Boston, and so did uh, dealers of woodenware who were traveling to Boston and to other cities and towns in Massachusetts, and all of these Teamsters made use of the tavern. The tavern played a very important role socially in the life of the community, and was probably the second most important social institution in colonial America after the church itself. 
They were often the busiest places in town because of the number of people who gathered there for the atmosphere and for the, that prevailed there and the various activities. This was a place where one can learn the latest news because the newspapers were dropped there and you would learn about what was happening in the world. They could discuss town affairs, gossip, play checkers, and drink and just visit with your neighbors. Many taverns featured dance halls. The Green Mountain House or the Box Tavern in Stoddard over the barn had a huge dance hall, for example. These were public facilities where residents could go to relax and to interact with others. They were often the center of the village activity. A great deal of governmental activity occur occurred in taverns in Cheshire County as well. Early town meetings were often held there. The first several town meetings in Stoddard were held in the Selectman's house because he operated a tavern. Several towns didn't have um, meeting houses for a number of years, so uh, town meetings were held in taverns. But even after the meeting house was built, they often still met at the taverns because they were warmer than the meeting house and they offered food and drink as well. Militia meetings and musters were held there, political strategy sessions, politicians would speak there. They really were often the centers of the communities. The tavern owners were often successful and prominent residents of the community because the selectmen realized that they might be more successful as tavern keepers, so it was more likely that they would receive a license from the selectmen. They often kept other jobs in addition to their tavern keeper duties because the entire family could help in the tavern. The children could help and the wives could help working in the tavern and cooking meals for the visitors. And sometimes wives ran the taverns or ladies ran the taverns themselves. Mary Dunbar in Keene operated the Dunbar Tavern on Main Street. After her husband died in the 1780s, she opened it to the public so she could make a living with her several children, one of them being Cynthia Dunbar, who was Henry David Thoreau's mother, who was born there on Main Street in Keene. So there's a quick overview of taverns, and we'll let the slideshow, I hope, tell us the rest of the story, then we'll wrap it all up at the end. And this is a slide tape program, so it runs itself. If it's too loud for you, move to the side. If it's not loud enough, come on in. We're using antique equipment. came about. When people traveled by horseback and stagecoach, they would stop at the taverns to warm themselves by the fireplaces. Fill up your time, boys. We'll give a pump, and then we'll break them down. Chase Tavern and was very popular with travelers. It was then on a road known as the Third New Hampshire Turnpike. The tavern was built in 1794 by Stephen Chase. If you go up to number 712 Court Street, you will see it. It's a great example of the colonial architecture of Keene's early days. The Historical Society of Cheshire County has some notes about a journal that was kept by one person who traveled through Keene in 1800 and who visited the Chase Tavern. These are some of the comments in that person's journal. Chase's Tavern, where we lodged last night, is a good tavern. 
but all sorts of people are there. We put up in a large room with three beds in it. Then up came four creatures who were noisy, profane mortals. That traveler's description of the creatures speaks about the profanity and filthy language. The traveler described them as inconsiderate wretches. And then he continued. We said nothing to them, arose early, paid our reckoning, mounted, and pursued on our journey. It would seem from that description that our traveler had an abundance of patience. A lesser man would have resorted to violence to end their bad behavior. That little scene gives you an idea of traveling in the early 1800s. You can see that strangers were assigned to the same rooms, sometimes even the same bed. If you needed a fire in your fireplace, there would be an extra charge, and the same for a bath. Another journal entry, this one in 1825, speaks about the Chase Tavern as being a good comfortable place and quite clear of lice. <laughs> taverns were private homes situated near the main roads. Owners of these homes added to their income by providing food and lodging for hungry and weary travelers. The colonial legislature passed laws to control the operation of these taverns. Since the taverns sold liquor, the laws stated that these public houses must provide lodging and stables. The tavern became a social meeting place for those who lived nearby. Travelers brought news of the world outside. The tree out front became the local bulletin board. The town's mail was left at the tavern. Weddings and dances were held in the ballroom upstairs. The tavern keeper was often a political leader in town. For example, Captain Wyman, he built his tavern on Main Street in Keene in 1762. At that time, there were only a handful of houses on Main Street. He and his son-in-law ran their home as a tavern for 40 years. Captain Wyman was a selectman, moderator, and representative to the provincial legislature. The first meeting of the trustees of Dartmouth College was held in the north parlor of this tavern in 1770. Five years later, Keene's Minutemen gathered on the front lawn prior to their march to Lexington and Concord. The date was April 1775. Improved roads called turnpikes were built in the early 1800s. More taverns were opened to handle the new stagecoach travelers, and larger public lodgings like the Cheshire House began to spring up. A few moments ago, we spoke about Chase's Tavern up on Court Street in Keene, but right up on Central Square stood the legendary Cheshire House. It was more than a tavern. Many dignitaries stayed there, including presidents and inventor Thomas Edison. The Cheshire House was built on the site of the old Phoenix Hotel. It burned in 1836, but in its day was considered to be the best in the county. While the Phoenix was burning, John Hatch threw a mirror out a bedroom window and carefully carried a feather bed down the stairs to the street. About 80 years ago, the Cheshire House had 140 rooms heated with steam and lighted with gas. On a late summer's day in 1899, the hotel register showed that there were 122 guests from 10 states at the Cheshire House. Across the square, Mary Dunbar, way back in the 1780s, had opened her home as a tavern. The income helped her to support her five children after her husband died. Today, the Dunbar house is known as Henry David's Restaurant. By the 1820s, there were 15 taverns operating here, the Eagle Hotel on Main Street became headquarters for people who took the stagecoach from Boston to Canada. On the night of January 21st, 1836, 150 years ago this year, a party of close to 200 people had sleigh rides, then came back to the Eagle Hotel to spend the evening dining and dancing. If you were to consider Keene as the hub of a wheel, you would see that other taverns, inns, and hotels were opened in towns north, south, east and west of that hub. The Asa Lawrence Tavern in Roxbury Center. It was built in 1811. Eighty years later, it was moved to Marlboro. Marlboro was also the site of the old Sweetser Tavern. There's a story about a muster, Henry Hunt, and a colt. The men at that muster bet Henry that he could not lead his horse up the stairs and into the hall. Henry took the bet, led the horse up the stairs, and collected the bet. But the colt refused to go down the stairs. Henry bought drinks for the men using all of his bet, and they later led the horse down the stairs. The Shepherd Tavern in Elstead was headquarters for town meetings. Its owner, J. 
General Amos Shepard served 11 terms in the New Hampshire legislature, seven of those years as president of the Senate. Peter Haywood's tavern in Surrey was licensed in 1765. It was probably that town's first tavern. Today, a private residence, it is the oldest house in Surrey. There were 44 taverns in Surrey by 1820. The Holbrook Tavern was one of them. Captain Francis Holbrook operated it. He always had a full house, never turning anyone away. If they were late, they would curl up in their heavy coats to sleep near the fire. Captain Holbrook was active in town and state politics. He kept a pair of oxen in his barn to help wagons up the long hill just beyond his tavern. Did I hear you say, how were things in Westmoreland? Well, at a tavern at Park Hill, owned by Captain Paul Brooks, there was an account book in which records were kept. In 1815, Daniel Farr, who lived nearby, ran up a bill totaling five dollars and ten cents, and that was for 19 and a half mugs of toddy, one punch and liquor, one glass of gin, two and a half glasses of grog, and twelve and a half mugs of flip. Flip was a homemade beer made from dried pumpkin, dried apple skins, bran, and a dash of rum. In Stoddard, the Central House was one of the county's best-known hotels in its day. And when it was removed in 1942, its bar, windows, flooring, doors, wainscoting, wall benches, and fireplaces were transported to the Spouter Tavern at the Mystic Connecticut Seaport Museum. The Village Hotel in Gilson was only a sleigh ride away when it opened in 1848. Seven years later, its name was changed to Ashwaylet House. Still a sleigh ride away, members of the Keen Ladies Social Club had a January day outing there, welcomed by the operators of the hotel with an elegant supper. On the commerce side of the ledger, the Ralston Tavern in Keene was a popular spot for Teamsters who carried butter and cheese from Vermont to the Boston Market. The Sheepskin Tavern in Hinsdale was the stopping over place for boatmen who used the Connecticut River prior to 1850 for freighting lumber, shingles, slate, livestock, and produce. Fitzwilliam has an interesting background in taverns and the inns. Thomas Goldsmith and Jonathan Fox were granted a license for their tavern in 1793. Seven years later, Fitzwilliam had six taverns and a population of 95. In the 1840s, the first trains came to Cheshire County. Residents of the county could travel to Boston in a few hours. Taverns began to disappear, hotels began to appear, and so began the era of the Grand Hotel. Families left the crowds, heat, and noise of the city to spend their summer at a resort hotel. 154,000 guests registered at New Hampshire's summer hotels in 1899. The state took in $3 million in income. Pine Grove Springs Hotel at Sparford Lake was one of them. It had its own golf course. The Prospect House on Sparford Lake was another. It was built in 1873, was doubled in size just nine years later, could accommodate 100 guests, offered a spectacular view. You could stay overnight for $2 or about $10 for a week a little more during peak summer months. And the Prospect House offered scenic cruises aboard the steamboat Enterprise. The Laurel Lake Inn in Fitzwilliam opened in 1897. It rented boats for 25 cents an hour, had a dance pavilion built over the water. Summer rentals began at the base of Mount Monadnock in the 1840s. Dublin was a summer resort area by the 1850s. On Mount Monadnock, the legendary mountain house was known far and wide. Built in 1861, it was three and a half stories high and offered rooms for 100 guests. It burned at the end of its first season, but was rebuilt seven years later with many additions to it during the following 20 years. Its name was changed to Halfway House in 1916. It, too, was destroyed by a fire in 1954. Changes in our modes of transportation brought about another change in our story of taverns, inns, and grand hotels. Enter the automobile. Roadside tourist cottages and motels were built. The Keene City Directory for 1953 listed two in Keene, the Motor Inn Motel and the Winding Brook Lodge. Winding Brook was completed in 1954 at a cost of half a million dollars and offering 40 rooms. Three years later, 20 more rooms were added. 
But those same automobiles found their way to the back roads on which our ancestors had traveled by stagecoach. Those colonial homes and taverns of the 17 and 1800s were rediscovered. The Sawyer Tavern, originally opened in West Keene in 1806, was reopened in 1922. The 1808 Daniel Bradford House in West Keene was rediscovered as the Bradford Inn and offered a tea room and a guest house in the 1930s. The Dublin Inn was praised by Yankee Magazine in 1966 as one of the finest in the country. In 1934, Ed Brummer bought the old Lakeview farm. As the Woodbound Inn, he helped to build the reputation it enjoys today. I was working in New York in the, in the bank, and a classmate of mine was out of a job, and he knew about this inn that had been open only five the year before. In other words, it was practically abandoned. I had worked in resorts all during school and college, but never had any idea of going into business. So, anyway, we came up in February, looked the place over. I gave up my job in, uh, in April, and we came up and started in. Now, all my experience was in, I called it running the house party. It wasn't innkeeping, it was running the house party. The Fitzwilliam Inn stands on the site of the original Goldsmith and Fox Tavern of the 1790s. A swimming pool was added and the original kitchen converted to a mm. cocktail lounge in the 1960s. Despite the changes converting this rustic old tavern into an up-to-date country inn, it still offers the same basic benefit as its 200 years of predecessors, rest and hospitality for the weary traveler. There's a good statement made by author Eric Sloan, which we'd like to quote as we come to the close of our visits. In every big city, you will find one or two untouched taverns where people go to enjoy escape from modern neon restlessness. Friendliness and comfort have not yet caught up with the modern cleanliness and smartness of our new highway architecture. And there are still those who would trade chromium brightness for the dim restfulness of the past. So come on, time to get started, gay and lighthearted. No need to ask us where. Down to the Bentley Tavern. Everyone's happy there. So you can see just how old this program is because of the date on there. So a few things have changed. No more Henry Davids, as we all know, now Margaritas. And the, the uh, Stoddard Inn that went to the Spouter Tavern at Mystic has now been taken out of the Spouter, and it is at Johnson & Wales University in Providence in their museum set up as a taproom. Fitzwilliam Inn hasn't changed much, yes. So, we really have taken a look at taverns when the roads were difficult and there were lots and lots of taverns so people could stop and warm themselves and get a meal. But transportation changes and improvements in roads and technology really brought about new changes. With the turnpikes and the stagecoaches, they had larger hotels such as the Eagle and the Cheshire House on Main Street in Keene. And then the trains came as well, and people would go into one city and they needed a larger hotel to stay in when they arrived or before they headed out on the train. And then the, the train also resulted in the resort hotels, when people wanted to get away from the heat and noise of the city, especially in the summer. And they would come to a large resort hotel on a lake such as Spofford or on a mountain such as Monadnock and spend a week or a month or sometimes the entire summer getting away from the city and getting back to nature at the, in the late 1800s. Then we saw the automobile technology arrive in the early 1900s and we began to see roadside cabins where people who were now driving wherever they wanted, not just where the train tracks went, could stop and rent a room 
and then we had motels where they would do the same. Then when people decided they wanted to get back to the countryside and see what life used to be like, those old homes opened as country inns and bed and breakfast inns. People came out to see what life in New England used to be like, and many of them came to the Courier and Ives Corner. We now have heritage tourists who are staying in many of those same old buildings, but now they're country inns. So we've come full circle, I guess. Any questions or comments? Things I have forgotten? Yes? When travelers came from other places in the South, for instance, mm -hmm. would they have slaves with them sometimes? And if so, would there be separate quarters? Sometimes they did. Uh, one place that I'm very familiar with for having southern travelers is uh, Saratoga Springs. Before the Civil War, that was a huge spa for southern travelers. They wanted to come up here and enjoy the waters and, and the gambling and everything else that was happening there. Some of them undoubtedly traveled with their slaves, and I'm sure they were not, they had a different housing situation for them. Yeah. Oh, yes, <laughs> sorry. So, um, you talked about the colonial period that taverns were licensed to have both food and lodging. Were there restaurants that were just food? And if not, when did that happen? <coughs> yes, there were. There were not nearly as many as now. The percentage would have been much smaller. It was more likely that you would go to a tavern. But there were some places that offered just meals. Yeah. Not really in any numbers until into the 1800s. Then you began to see small lunch rooms and so forth, and especially in the larger towns, and especially where the stages went, and then the railroads. I would say that's an impossible question to answer. No, I don't. <laughs> the um, number still standing is quite large. Most of them are private residences now. I don't know what percentage that is, but very few of them are taverns. However, the, one of the oldest ones, the oldest one they say in New Hampshire, is the Hancock Inn in Hancock, New Hampshire, still operated as, as a tavern and as an inn. Um, and the, the Fitzwilliam Inn as well is one of the early ones, although it hasn't been open continuously like Hancock. It still continues to be used in that way since the 1700s. So there are a few very, very old ones still surviving and more of them surviving as residences today. Is the Chase one up on Court Street a residence? It is a private residence. It has been for many years. Yes. <laughs> the Chase Tavern she was asking about, where the person went in and had a difficult evening with the rowdy mortals who came upstairs and slept in the same room, yes. Is there a simple answer as to why so many places like that burned? I, I mean, could be why? There's a combination of reasons, and this, this probably the most simple one is that they had open fireplaces and they all burned wood and uh, there was no good firefighting equipment, no fire departments and no fire engines. So it was, fire was very, very common. Yeah. And they had flax and straw and all sorts of other things in the houses and near the fireplaces and, and made clothes all winter near the fireplaces. So it was very, very common to have fires in these, these early homes, all made from wood in this region. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Can you identify uh, homes in Chesterfield that were once used as taverns that still exist today? Uh, the Stone House. Yeah, besides that. <laughs> Someone here can probably do that better than me because I don't know all of them. Yeah. Neil? <laughs> I'm, a I'm a little nervous, so I'm not sure. But down the road here, there are two, there's a house that looks like yes, two houses. Yes, a double house, right. And that was the first um, Chesterfield Inn. And then, of course, the Chesterfield, Chesterfield Inn, Inn started as, somebody tell me what it was. Carriage Museum? No, it had a, it had a name before that. Neelan? Neelan Tavern, thank you. And Spofford Village, there were a couple that have burned. There was one where the post office is now, mm -hmm. that's gone. 
Um, what? Oh, Limberoski's house might have been a tavern. That was the Spofford house. You're right. What was Tower Light Inn? That's right. There's uh, one in uh, West Chesterfield that's now a private home that used to be called Chesterfield Inn. It's now the Chesterfield House. And then the one across from um, Chester Chesterfield Tire with the coffin doors used to be an inn. Right. And then Silverdale, mm -hmm. which is gone, but interesting about the, the um, Sawyer Tavern that we saw the very first picture. In the stone house, we have a wonderful bar system where you saw at the yes, end of the show. At, near the end of the show. That show. came from the Sawyer Tavern. Ah, yeah. I didn't know that. And the Sawyer Tavern was opened just as, I mean, was opened again right. in 19... 20 something. 20 something. Yeah. And that's when uh, Morris Friedsom obtained that bar and put it into the stone house. Because mm -hmm. that's when he owned the stone house. Right. Yes, so that one had been a tavern in the 1700s and early 1800s, and then a private home. And then when automobiles came, it reopened as, a, as an inn once again. Thank you for knowing much more about Chesterfield than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else I can add? Thank you very much. Good. <laughs>